Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And we'll just get into it here very, very quickly. We've got about seven inquiries on this video, and um, there's a wide range of them. So um, here's the first. Chadley asks about VLED and neurons and neural pathways. Thank you for your time to answer these. I purchased a few VLED devices. I purchased one for my wife because of her cancer. We are also using Velasta, but my wife has had brain tumors that have gone necrotic. These tumors have caused damage. One large tumor was cutting off the fourth ventricle to her spine, causing spinal fluid disruption. This forced the doctors to need to surgically remove as they thought previously the tumor was necrotic, but had no choice in this instance. Um, let me stop there for just a minute. It, this happens whether you're treating with chemo, radiation, or Velasta, especially in the brain with glioblastoma, for example, um, there's no place for the dead necrotic tissue to get past the skull. So it can accumulate there until the uh, lymphatic or the blood system is capable of re removing it one debris particle at a time. So you can get an inflammatory response. It makes no difference what kills the cancer, it's the, it's the, quote, dead bodies on the battlefield that have to be cleaned up. And it's very difficult in the brain without having some sort of an inflammatory response. My question is, is there any practicality or science to using the VLED for her to establish healthy neural pathways and neuronal signals? She has quite a bit of rebuilding to do with her cerebellum and mechanical aspects between the brain communication, et cetera. I have this light on multiple times a week, hoping it is doing something for her. The doctors did not remove any brain tissue, which is very good. Only the tumor, as they didn't even need to take a buffer around the tumor. So what this means is that the body had built a and isolated it, similar to a cyst, actually built a sac around it. So her, her uh, neurons probably saw pressure from the uh, tumor, but they still, very high percentage of those still may be intact. So that's a very good thing. Um, thoughts on this would be helping her to regain brain function, then any science or thoughts. Um, the VLED the VLED will activate the microglia. The microglia is what we use to clean up this kind of debris in the brain. So the more active the microglia, the uh, faster the, these dead bodies on the battlefield get cleaned up. Um, there's always trauma when you have a, a, a surgical procedure, um, but it, it's not something that is unmanageable. The VLED will keep the energy level of the microglia in an elevated state, causing them to remain quite active 24 hours a day. So it will definitely heal with uh, the removal of that tissue. So I would still do both. You want to keep the inflammatory response down using Velasta. You want to clean up the debris field with the VLED. I hope that answered your question, Chadley. Heidi asks about AC. Um, I am familiar with it. Um, I'm not a big proponent of it. It's basically salt water. And uh, I'm just not in a position at this point to recommend it. Um, I'm not convinced that it really does anything at this point other than increase your sodium level, which is not good for your blood pressure. Um, so I'm not a big proponent of it, and I would never recommend it. Stephanie asks about killer T cell immunotherapy treatment was diagnosed with glioblastoma on November the 9th after a scan revealed a tumor in my brain on the front right on November 6th. I had it removed and the surgeon felt she got it all. The treatment was to be radiation and chemo. I chose to just do the radiation treatment, which I started on December 22nd for six weeks. I started high dose vitamin C right away and, started, and just started uh, astaxanthin a few days ago. My original treatment idea was radiation, vitamin C, going to Mexico for three weeks for immunotherapy treatment with uh, CAR-T or killer T cells. Then a friend of, me, friend of mine told me about two of her family members that had tremendous success with astaxanthin. What is your opinion on killer T cell immunotherapy treatment? 
Would it help fight off the cancer cells or do I just need to take astaxanthin? Um, killer T-cell immunotherapy oftentimes is called CAR-T therapy. They will remove your blood cells. They will change the um, structure of those T-cells and then re-inject those. The, um, the, the CAR-T uh, treatment is, it, it works in most cases. It's very, very expensive. Um, but the outcome is going to be the same whether you use CAR-T or you use just astaxanthin. There's no side effects with astaxanthin, and it's one one-thousandth the cost of the uh, CAR-T or killer T-cell immunotherapy. Um, the success rate for CAR-T may be slightly exaggerated. Um, I, we can't get definitive da data on the number of um, uh, long-term um, success with CAR-T. It's more of an acute treatment to stop the growth of the cancer cell, but they're not dealing with the cause of cancer, which is your measure of reactive oxygen species that you are predisposed to generate. The only way to do that is with the high, sensit uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. I suggest everybody run that. Keep it less than three milligrams per liter. In some cases, they report it as millig milligrams per DL or deciliter. In those cases, you have to multiply that number by 10. So a, a 0.5 milligrams per deciliter equates to five milligrams per liter. So keep that in mind when you look at the units of that test. Isaac asks about elevated white blood cell count. <clears throat> Back in mid-November of this year, I started taking astaxanthin, had a doctor appointment November 28th, and had plantar fasciitis diagnosed. While there, the doctor had me do my annual blood test. The results showed an elevated white blood count of 18.9. Normal range is 4 to 11. Also, my neutrophils and immature granulocytes were elevated, which are both connected to WBC count. My doctor had me retest today, and all three were still high but about half of what they were the first time. So my question is, does astaxanthin fight inflammation by increasing white blood cells? Uh, no, it doesn't. What it does is typically when you see these kinds of data, it means that you had some sort of an infection or a cold when your uh, blood was taken. Um, it's not indicative of cancer um, or, or anything like that. You just had a, a, a slight infection um, or a cold. Astaxanthin uh, stops inflammation, but it does not increase white blood cells. White blood cells are a result, or the increase in white blood cells is a result of increased in inflammatory signals from either interleukin-6 or interleukin-8, or both. And uh, white blood cell counts only um, increase when an inflammatory condition is realized in the body. Astaxanthin does not increase white blood cells. Vilma asks about the plastic bottles. The product is supposed to help prevent cancer, but plastic causes cancer. Any further information regards this? Okay, plastics does not cause cancer. Plastics are totally inert. Polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, um, polystyrene, uh, polyethylene, polycarbonate, polysulfone. Um, plastics are inert. They're, they're very long chains. They're called macromolecules. Typically, they don't even get absorbed into your bloodstream. But upon the degradation of those plastics, you can get smaller molecules like polyterephthalates or, or, uh, or terephthalates or... Um, um, HCl, hydrochloric acid from uh, vinyl chloride, or chlorinated small chain ethylene chloride. And those small molecules can migrate, but we're talking about parts per trillion. The odds of anybody getting cancer from plastic is so low that you're not going to live long enough to actually get a from uh, the terephthalate that might leach out of a plastic bottle into your water, there's, that's a molehill compared to the mountains out there. 
Um, you eat two apples is going to create cancer faster, two apples a day. It's going to increase cancer faster than all of the bottles of water and plastic that you could ever drink. So um, just because these things exist, life in, in general is, is a risk. Breathing oxygen will kill you faster than any form of molecules leaching out of plastic containers. Oxygen kills everybody. So let's not worry about molehills when there's mountains out there. So what you want to do, it doesn't make any difference what causes reactive oxygen species in our body. What we want to do in those four free radicals, superoxide, singlet oxygen, peroxyl, and hydroxyl free radical, we want to eliminate those four. That's the cause of over 92% of all human death from an inflammatory disease. And they can come from a whole multitude of places, smoking cigarettes, eating um, fried foods, breathing in oxygen, um, being exposed to prescription drugs, any drugs. Uh, marijuana is by far, the, the smoking marijuana is by far uh, more carcinogenic than anything we could ever get from, a, from all the plastic you would ever be associated with your entire life. Uh, smoking one cigarette a day is going to uh, cause so much reactive oxygen species that um, it's very difficult to get it under control. So everybody, please measure your high sensitivity C-reactive protein. I'm not interested in what causes the ROS. My interest is in preventing the ROS to reach such an inventory in your body that it now begins to present as an inflammatory disease. That's the key to this whole um, concept of inflammatory disease and death. Norma asks about osteoporosis. Women in 70s has osteoporosis. What calcium brand does Sam recommend? Any other vitamins he recommends? Trouble swallowing pills, is there a powder? Or can she take the capsule apart? Um, osteoporosis is, is one of those things that has multiple steps to get the calcium that you eat onto the bone in your skeleton. There's probably 20 to 22 different biological processes to assimilate calcium from your diet and deposit it on the bone in your skeleton. Each one of those has to be working perfectly. Any deficiency in any one of those 22 biological pathways, it, it makes no difference how much calcium you consume. It will not be deposited onto your skeleton. So osteoporosis is a form of arthritis. It causes bone loss from um, hydroxyl or free radical attack of the bone. It's all inflammatory. So there's two angles here. One is how fast can you put calcium onto the bone and how fast is the calcium being removed from your bone? If the rate at which I'm putting calcium onto the bone is higher than the rate at which it's leaving the bone, then you're going to build bone tissue. If the rate of bone loss from inflammatory disease from having a high C-reactive protein, for example, is, is greater than the rate at which I can put it on there, you're going to lose your bone. So this is the balance we have to maintain. Ideally, they're, they're in equilibrium. So what calcium brand does Sam recommend? I'm not going to recommend one. They, um, uh, th there's several out there. You can, they're usually salts, either calcium chloride, calcium phosphate, um, calcium diphosphate. Um, there's several out there that will get calcium into your stomach, get it dissolved into your bloodstream. If you cannot get it out of your bloodstream and assimilate it into your bone structure, you'll end up with high calcium in your bloodstream, which can add to atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. So it's a very thin line. The, what we focus on is stopping the bone loss in the bones by reducing your inflammatory disease state. I hope this makes sense. So let's just not lose the bone 
and rely on the existing process of putting calcium on the bone, even though it's at a reduced rate. But let's stop losing calcium from our skeleton. Um, it, it's a different approach. Um, other vitamins that are crucial in the uh, deposition of calcium onto the skeleton is vitamin D, vitamin K. Um, there's actually some prescription uh, meds that they can give you to increase the rate at which we can get the calcium deposited onto the skeleton. But you want to address both issues. Um, increase the rate of deposition, decrease the rate of loss. That's the solution to osteoporosis.